like to think of the human family tree looking like, I mean, well, a tree. Or like this linear progression from monkey to great ape to ancient human to modern human, but I'm here to say it's wrong, actually. Our family tree is less of a tree and more of a bush. Lots of ancient humans came out of Africa in waves. And we went back into Africa and then we came out of Africa again and we went back into Africa and came out of Africa again and we went back into Africa and came out of Africa again. And we did this over hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions. Humans intermingled, intermixed, some bred with others. It's what we mean is sex, obviously. Rebecca has it exactly right. And over hundreds of thousands of years, all of that mixing and adaptation to climates and terrains and survival created this single amazing species that remains today. <laughs> Not a single line, but like paint splattering on an ancient wall, Homo sapiens came out of the splatters that mixed, creating new colors. Lots of these ancient people, of course, died. It's not clean, it's not perfect. It's actually very human when you think about it this way. So this is episode two out of five in our origin series, and I'm gonna track humans from ape to us. Let's kick into it. What's up, Internet? I am Trace. Thank you for tuning in. Humans are now on every continent. Every nook and cranny of this planet has some kind of human on it or a human influence over it. Under the surface, under the ocean, in space, there are humans everywhere. But this massive lineage that got us here is complicated. And I'm not an expert, so I called Dr. Rick Potts, the head of the Human Origins Project at the... Um, Smithsonian, I think it's what it's called. I think that's what it's Smithsonian. Right, 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 right. You've definitely heard of them. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Rick. And uh, we can see that over the course of human evolution um, that there have been anywhere from 20 to 25 different species uh, of early humans that have been discovered so far. All life evolves and it, uh, it either, you know, adapts or moves or becomes extinct and bites the dust and sometimes even gets buried in the dust. So we have fossils that really tell us a lot of this story. Those species can be uh, grouped together in sort of four major groups. Um, one is the group to which we belong. So the four groups that... Rick is talking about are Homo, that is us, the human, and then there's Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and Artipithecus. They're all on Earth some of them at the same time. And some of us left Africa, but not all of these different groups did. And within each group, there are subgroups and species. The earth was positively teeming with humans and human cousins. Look at this chart I put together. Each of these lines is one human genus that existed at the same time in some cases. Look at that, there are so much overlap. And this is just the genus Homo. There's also Australopithecus and Paranthropus. They had multiple species already. We don't know that much about, but that's okay. Look at all of these different people. And the big question is, why did we dominate? It's kind of the mystery of human evolution. Uh, it goes from about six or seven million years ago up to about four million uh, years ago. And um, they were, uh, those species took the first steps in becoming upright walking. And, um, you know, they probably experimented a lot in different styles of walking upright on two legs based on the anatomy that we see in the fossils. Sorry if you thought that it was a simple, clean family tree or a simple, clean line from here to there, from this to human. That's not how it went. And actually, today, it's even more complicated. We had already become um, anatomically something that was looking almost like us 300,000 years ago in Africa, but certainly by 150,000 years ago, we were basically looking very similar to what we are now. Um, and we had already been dispersing out of Africa by that point. So the oldest fossils that look like um, they could well be Homo sapiens are in um, the Near East, and they're about 180,000 years. Whereas we used to think that this encounter with Neanderthals only happened very late, around 40,000 years ago when they disappear. So that the chronology for potential contact and interactions has got massive compared to what it used to be. Somewhere over 200,000 years ago, there seems to have been a movement out of Africa of Homo sapiens and at that point. So in terms of who was where and what was going on and who was like interacting with each other, it's 
so much more complex, but much more interesting as well. At one point, Homo heidelbergensis was a common ancestor of us and the Neanderthal. That's right, there were hundreds of thousands of years of overlap between our different groups, and we were not running this race alone. We just beat the next racers at the end, assuming you want to characterize it as a race at all. It was a geological photo finish. Neanderthals are like our cousins. We would recognize ourselves in them if we saw them face to face. And at some point, we split off from them at a time when we were spread thin, like a one little tub of cream cheese for a whole huge bagel. Why do they do that? Give me like four of those things. And then we met up again. We saw each other on either side of a river and we said, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I mean, I'm guessing, of course, but I, we can only guess. So I asked the expert, Dr. Teresa Steele. Well, I guess maybe four options that I can imagine. So one, you just mentioned the, the fighting that people are like, ah, there's another human. We're going to fight and try to kill each other. And um, given that those modern humans um, had spear throwers and Neanderthals at that point probably only had thrusting or short range spears, I think it's pretty clear who would win um, that battle, unfortunately. Well, and we know because we're here. The four options, as I characterize them here, are the four Fs. There's fight, food, filth, and f You have these modern humans coming in who are just able to be more successful hunters, their populations are going up. They're just kind of edging the Neanderthals out cave site by cave site by cave site, then you have modern humans taking over. And then there are some people who, um, in fact, what we know from more recent kind of human expansions would argue that um, disease might have been. So that no real direct conflict, but modern humans came in, they were an invasive species, bringing all their modern diseases, modern human diseases with them. And of course, I gotta beep it out, not just for the kids, but because it's funnier to beep it out all the time. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't swear on secret, I actually feel super good, but I still, you know, I just don't wanna be that guy. Just like the fourth proven thing that the Neanderthals had. You know, well, there's evidence of interbreeding. So there's the run up and love each other, love each other hopefully in a friendly way. Um, that would be an option. And we do have evidence of interbreeding. Overall, Neanderthals appear much more like bonobos than chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are very aggressive and territorial and they do not like strangers. Bonobos are a lot more um, open to sort of friendly relations and uh, everything we see about Neanderthal behavior suggests they, they could well have been more like that. So there's no reason to assume that meetings between us and them always had to have some sort of conflict and you know aggression going on. When you are talking about genetic exchange and hybrid babies, in order for there to be the Neanderthal genes still in us today visible, those hybrid babies, they had to have been able to grow up in whichever group they were in, to adapt, to understand that cultural context, um, and you know, be successful enough to then have their own children. So all of these people, according to our experts, were flung all over the planet, and most would never ever meet. 1.9 million years ago, the genus Homo was spread from Africa all the way through Asia. And again, we found Neanderthals in Western Europe all the way up into Siberia. These human species were everywhere. There was multiple migrations out of Africa and probably even more than what we can pick up in the archeological record. So one of the traditional things we say is that it's possible that the use of fire allowed us to have another wave of um, leaving Africa to move into more seasonal environments. Unfortunately, the evidence for that is um, sparse. We hit Europe about 46,000 years ago, we being humans, homo sapiens. When we got there, we met Neanderthals. And of course, then ancient human sex time happened, A-H-S-T, Anyway, the thing is, we're hopping in and out of the uh, African cradle, if you will. And that's kind of strange to me. So I asked Teresa. Um, is it like a suburb, a slow crawl, or is it just like one group decided to go and, and start walking and they stopped sometimes and had another group go in the future? It's really hard to, to know. It looks like expansion may have actually gone first into um, more the, the Asian, um, part of Eurasia and it 
people are speculating it may be that it's Neanderthals that are limiting movement going west because the Neanderthals are there. And um, a lot of dense research into trying to figure out the, the paths of migrations within Europe and where Neanderthals and um, modern humans might have interacted. As a tropical evolved organism, we weren't adapted to mountainous, cooler environments of Europe and elsewhere. We were not used to the desert. We had some grasslands, but we had to learn new ways to find food. This didn't happen with just one individual. It wasn't just one dude out there, you know, the Steve Jobs of ancient humans being like, I have discovered how to market this bow and arrow very well to everyone, so now we should be able to find food. It's called the eye bow, because you have to pull I you have to pull it's an eye, eye bow. <laughs> no, it was over generations. And we had to learn about warmer clothing. Again, over generations. You had to hunt animals and then you realized you could put the animal fur over you and then over time you would get used to having the animal fur over you and then you'd realize maybe we should bring the animal fur with us so we can you know, wrap it around ourselves. And then again, generations before we figured out that we could sew it into the shapes of our bodies. Lots and lots of people did not succeed at this. Lots and lots of dead humans over these hundreds of thousands of years. Then around 13,000 years ago, in North and South America, we had humans because they lived on the land bridge that existed between the Russian Asian area to where we are in the North American area as we know them now. And they lived on a land bridge between the two. The Bering Strait land bridge was so huge that people could live there and they didn't just live there for a couple days. They lived there for generations, slowly moving from this valley to the next, from this forest to that, from this grassland to that marsh. And those people became genetic cousins to the people in Asia. It wasn't direct. And again, it didn't happen cleanly. It all happened amidst a crazy earth. Not crazy like now, now we're in the super rapid heating change, but earth had lots of swings in temperature from warm to cold. Let me give you an example. Two million years ago, there were 40,000 year climate cycles. We can see them in ice cores that we have dug out of, out of the ancient ground. And those warm, cold periods correlate with one cycle of the tilt and wobble of the planet. That tilt changes the amount of sunlight about 10% that reaches the ground, which is enough to end ice ages. But then 800,000 years ago, it changed from 40,000 year cycles to 100,000 year cycles. I'm not really sure why, but humans are coming up in that period. Literally, they were actually breathing literally the same air, if you really think about it. And of course, the air mix has changed in the last 200 years. There's more CO2, there's more heat, there's more rapid warming than we've seen for almost a million years, even more than that, but we'll come back to that later. Ancient humans had a lot to deal with. Not to mention, there was no delivery, no cars to get around, no one to cook and clean for you. Actually, clean, you know, might be relative considering I guess they are ancient humans. They lived in caves and outside. We could spend months exploring the migration patterns of ancient humans, you know, what ancient people ate, the first Europeans, how Neanderthals and cavemen lived, and the evolutionary leaps that happened over time. Seriously, we could spend months on that. Or you could hit up Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream has big budget documentaries that cover literally all of the topics that I just mentioned and so much more. And once you sort of get full up on ancient humans, you could hop over to physics, deep space, the deep ocean, they have it all. And right now with my promo code here, you can get CS for a year. And if you join Curiosity Stream, you'll actually get Nebula for free. Nebula has dozens of creators uploading new stuff every single day. And by joining, you directly support us creators, you know, Polyphonic, Braincraft, Renee Ritchie, me, Jade from Up and Adam, and so many more. It is awesome. And remember, we own the service. So it's a real win. And some creators even upload special Nebula only episodes just for y'all, which makes it a win-win. Curiosity Stream loves Nebula so much that they've bundled them together for a little over a dollar a month. That's right, for less than 15 bucks a year, you can get both CS and Nebula. So you can listen to David Attenborough narrating tales about tiny hummingbirds, and then learn to think like a lawyer with Devin from Legal Eagle, or come watch my show as well. But of course, you're already watching my show. To get all of this, use the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash trace. It's super easy, curiositystream.com slash trace. The link is down below. It's only 124 cents per month, and you can feel good because clicking that link directly helps me keep this channel going, so thank you. But enough about streaming, let's get back to ancient humankind. You know, back over here. 
So over the next few hundred thousand years, humans were busy spreading out and taking over. They jumped out of Africa, they moved into Europe, they met the Neanderthals, they met other ancient human species, some of which they would hang out with, some of which they wouldn't. But sometime around 74,000 to 70,000 years ago, we almost went extinct. We, humans, the superior supreme being, multipass, we almost went extinct. Scientists think that this might have been a result of extreme climate change, or as one controversial hypothesis suggested, the devastating after effects of the eruption of the Toba supervolcano in Indonesia. We're not sure. But at this time, there may have been as few as 10,000 reproductive age adults in the world. We would consider those people endangered. That species would be on the endangered species list today. That was us. Fortunately though, Humans came back from the brink, even as one of our relatives, Homo erectus, did not and went extinct. We've learned more and more over the past decades. We've done more field work, both um, archeological field work and paleontological field work. We're appreciating how very um, bushy our family tree is, that at many points in time, there's a lot of hominins, which are kind of bipedal, um, apes out there on the landscape and this process of how it is that we became the one that persists now um, is really really important. Our understanding of the the deeper hominin evolutionary context over the past sort of three decades has really transformed and it looks a lot busier than it used to and that's also reflected in the genetics now the more samples of Neanderthals that we've looked at the more evidence we find for there having been multiple phases of contact and interbreeding going back potentially over 200,000 years and we don't know where that happened. So this whole long tale is to say we went from ape to human through slow change. And as humans started to spread out into the world, we met these other people. And once there are only a few species left spread around the world, there was a point when we, the Homo sapiens, started to spread and win and continue to spread and win. We were the victors, the last lonely humans left on this planet. And for many thousands of years, we thought we were the only ones. Now we know our families were here with us. We came up with others, right? We came up with Neanderthalensis. We came up with all of these other homos. We are their legacy. But still, like anyone with a survivor legacy asking, you know, why us? Why did we live? And they didn't. That's a question we can answer next time. So make sure you come back for the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to this one. I am Trace. You can subscribe, please, and join us here on my channel. You can also come and find me on Patreon. You can find me literally all over the internet at Trace Dominguez. I really hope that you appreciate this. Special thanks to all of the guests we've had so far, and there's gonna be more, so please come back. Thanks again. I'll see you in the future.